Okuna Media's Polity, I'm Sane Jamimi. Historian Martin Plot is in conversation with Polity about his book titled Dr. Abdullah Abdurrahman, South Africa's Best Elected Black Politician. So Martin, can you tell us what drew your attention to Dr. Abdullah Abdurrahman's life? And can you also tell us what led you to write a book about him? Well, I was always fascinated about how it was that uh, South Africa went from having a constitution in which certainly in the Cape and to a lesser extent in Natal, it was possible for anybody, as long as they were a man and as long as they had money, to vote. And from 1830, for nearly 100 years, it was, it will, there was no racial qualification for the vote. The, everybody, as long as they were men, as long as they had money, could vote. And that was extended by the British, and there were thousands, tens of thousands, of uh, people of color who had the vote. And then it was taken away. And I was fascinated about how this happened. How was it that the, the right to vote, which is absolutely central to everybody's human rights, their democratic rights, uh, you know, I mean, I, of course, it should have been extended to, to women as well. I'm not trying to argue whether it was right or wrong, but it was exactly the same as it was in Britain. In the Cape and in Natal, that was the situation. In the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, which were the, the old Boer republics, uh, only white men could vote. There was no, there was no qualification on, uh, on, on, on wealth, but only white men could vote, but that was not true in the Cape and Natal. And I was amazed how this happened. And then I saw that there was a delegation that went to London in 1909 to try to save that vote and to get extended to the rest of the country when the Union of South Africa comes about. Of course, that was one of the great British projects at the end of the Boer War. Um, and finally, it was achieved in 1910. But unfortunately, this didn't happen. Instead, only in the Cape did they maintain the right to vote. And one of the people who was on that, that uh, delegation was Dr. Abdurrahman. And I then became really fascinated about how he, what he did, how he came to be a city councillor in Cape Town, what his life was. And I gradually started working on him. I must say, the, this book opens up a lot of history that we as South Africans are not aware of. Can you then, Martin, give us some background into his life from bringing uh, the grandson of slaves through training now in Scotland and as a doctor and then returning to the Cape with his wife? Well, as you say, he, he was a descendant of, of slaves. They lived in the town of Wellington, which is near Pal, uh, you know, what an, an hour's drive from, from Cape Town uh, northwards. In, it's a, it's a fruit-growing area. And they had a small shop there. And then they decided to move to the to the to Cape Town. I think for his um, uh, for his education, and uh, he he did very well. He went to Saxe, which was uh, he was in fact one of the very few um, people of color, boys of color, who went to the South African College School, which still exists. I mean, still a, 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 a very prestigious school in in Cape Town, and. Um, he actually went there, and then from there, the headmaster helped him uh, to go to, uh, to Scotland, to Glasgow, to the university there, because the headmaster himself had links with, with Glasgow. Uh, and interestingly, and it's, it's something that all people also don't really know much about, Dr. Abdurrahman was by no means the first, um, uh, he, he was, you know, Malay or coloured, but I mean, he was by no means the first um, person of colour from South Africa to, uh, to go to, to Glasgow. In fact, there was quite a strong tradition of people going from uh, the Eastern Cape. They went um, through the, the missionaries, sent, sent them, and they went and they got, they got education. And it was also, it was while he was there that Dr. Abdurrahman met a young Scottish woman uh, by the name of Nellie Porter, her real name was Helen, but she was always called Nellie, and um, they fell in love, they got married, and it was quite an amazing marriage because he not only had to explain to her, listen, you know, I'm going to go back to South Africa, you know, you, you might have a tough time there as a, you know, married to somebody of colour, and I'm also Muslim, 
would you join me in that? And she said, yes, she would. And that was really remarkable for her to do it, to take care of both those things. She became Muslim, um, at least officially. She never really became Muslim. I mean, she was, uh, she re retained, I think she was Christian, but I don't think she was very religious. Um, and she went with him back to, to Cape Town and they arrived back there and made their home in Cape Town. He also uh, represented uh, some of the poorest people in, in Cape Town or on the city council and then on the provincial council, as well as serving the, the 36 years uh, in the city. Can you tell us about his fight for the people of District 6? No, I mean, I mean, of course, everybody who, who know, who's been to Cape Town knows Cape Town. Mm -hmm. Uh, knows what a, the tragic story of District 6, the way that it was destroyed under the apartheid system and is still to this day. And I think this is a, a huge shame on the people of Cape Town that it is still today mostly an area of rubble. They've never managed to sort out exactly who had the right to go back to there, but it, it's so sad. But it was also um, in, the, in the early part of the, of the 20th century, in the period after the uh, before the, the First World War, it was a period in which people of all colors and all faiths uh, mixed. It had been quite a prosperous area. It gradually became poorer and poorer. Um, but there were Jewish traders. There were um, people from Tristan de Kuna came there. There were um, people from the Caribbean came and lived, lived in that area. And, and uh, there were people who also worked on the docks. Who, who lived there, but there are also people like Dr. Abdurrahman who set up his home uh, quite near what, what became Roland Street Jail. Um, very uh, beautiful house, actually. Um, and he and his wife lived there and they, they set about, they, they got, he got a doctor's practice going and he did very well. And um, that was the basis for them. He then began to get involved in politics. Um, he first uh, calls on um, the, uh, the local uh, administrator to allow, make sure that everybody was, had the right to serve on a jury and that it wasn't just restricted to white people. And um, he made quite an impression. They told him he was, he was a bit uh, pushy, uh, but <laughs> which is certainly true. He was always very pushy. Um, but he, uh, and then people came to, he came to people's attention and gradually they said, well, would you stand for the seat? Now they'd always been represented by whites in District 6. And he said, yes, I will. And there was no reason why he couldn't. And in 1904, he's actually elected ahead of everybody else. And he serves on the city council, except for a, a very small great break for 36 years. And then, as you said, he later becomes a member of the provincial council. And he's one of a very small handful of people of color who are on the provincial council. So even before the First World War, you have people of color in the Cape um, representing their communities and speaking out for their communities. And that is why he, you know, he's, he's such a sort of path-breaking person. Martin took us through his opposition to the formation of the Union of South Africa, which sought to exclude the majority of black population from its political life. Before he uh, became on the city council, the African Political Organization, or APO, had been formed. It was uh, aimed at uh, colored people. Uh, I mean, in, in those days, people uh, basically organized by race. So you had the Indian Congress, you had the African National Congress, you had the, the African People's Organization, which as I say was a colored organization really. Although they didn't exclude people of other colors, it was really a colored organization. And he, um, he then joined up uh, with, with people and, and campaigned for all sorts of things. But in, in, as I said, in 1909, when it is clear that the Union of South Africa is coming about, he joins with other people, and it's the very first time that there is a genuinely non-racial uh, delegation goes to Britain. It's led by W.P. Schreiner, who was a former prime minister of the Cape. He was also the brother of Olive Schreiner, the very famous novelist who wrote uh, about, about South Africa at the time. And um, it, there, were, there were two whites on it. There were a whole series of, uh, of African people, including uh, people who later went on to found the African National Congress. And then there were people like Dr. Abdurrahman who were colored. 
The only group that was not included were Indians, because Gandhi led a separate delegation of Indians where he was looking for slightly different things. So they go to, 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 to London and they passionately implore the, the British Parliament not to pass an act in which they don't have the vote. But unfortunately, by this time, for a variety of reasons, mostly because Britain desperately needed, they knew they were going to war with Germany in 1914, which was only, what, five years away. It was clear that it was going to be a world war. They needed the uh, South Africa to send troops. And for that reason, they did a deal with the, the whites, particularly the Afrikaners. So Boerter and Smuts, who were the key people there, uh, demanded that, they, that the constitution that they'd brought from South Africa should not be changed in any way. The only way in which it was changed was that they requested that the Suto, Botswana, Swaziland should be included in South Africa, and the British said no. And that was the only thing they really got. So I'm afraid it was, a, it was a, not a success. They went home, unfortunately, not having achieved what they did. But in the Cape, the constitution remained, although the, as a non-racial constitution, although in the rest of South Africa, it was only white, whites, and in those days, white men that could vote. Talking about the, the African National Congress, it was also interesting to read that he used to work with political parties like the ANC while leading his party now, the African Political Organization. Can you then, Martin, tell us how he led from the front in, in fighting the evident threats of racism in the colored community? I, that was a, a really big issue. I mean, before 1909, this, this delegation to, to Britain, he really fought mostly for the colored people. After 1909, he came to realize that there's no point in just trying to fight for the colored people. He worked for the people of color, whatever they were, Indians or, or Africans. And I mean, he was, he was a personal friend of Sol Pleike, uh, the first secretary general of the ANC, who actually was himself a member of the APO. He was a member of uh, Dr. Abdurrahman's party in Kimberley. Um, and uh, he was a good friend of John Dubé, the first president of the, of the uh, African National Congress. And they got on very, very well. The problem really was that although there were many, many different initiatives that both sides took to try to um, link it up. And it, I mean, the first time that the, the African National Congress comes to, the, to Cape Town to speak to the government, they have a meeting with, with Dr. Duraman and they agree to work jointly on things. But somehow there's never quite sufficient uh, pressure for that to succeed. So what they really did was that they, they kept saying they were going to work together and they tried to work together. And there were campaigns that they had, joint campaigns, um, to resist the advances of racism. But they never for formed one single organization. And I think it was partly because they were working within their own communities to try and get them going those organizations going, and they, that was what they spent most of their time doing. When I read the book, I felt like you were also trying to address the issue of racial education when you spoke about his family, because now his daughters were rejected to attend the school at, at Good Hope Seminary. How was this addressed? Well, that was a, a huge blow to him and to mm. his wife, Nelly, uh, because they, they had hoped that they would go, and they were both very bright young, young women, I'm afraid it was, it, they, it, he, he tried hard, so did his wife, but they were, they were blocked and eventually they were told, no, you can't do it. So he went about pursuing um, uh, the education of uh, the, uh, the community in which he was living then. And he, he, a number of schools were, were, were founded by, as a result of his initiative, one was Trafalgar, the other was Livingston, and um, then there were a whole series of, of Muslim schools that he also founded for people, for the Muslim community, the Malay community, who wanted to have a separate education. And he founded those as well. I think there's something like 15 of those that he founded. And um, he worked with, with, with teachers as well and was behind the scenes a big influence in the Teachers League of South Africa. So he was passionate about education, not just for his own children, but for his whole um, community. I think that if there was anything that he made a, a lasting impression on, it was on the education of uh, particularly the colored community where he was, he worked 
day and night um, to make sure that this was, this was possible. And he, he essence, essentially said, you know, the basis of a strong community is good education. That was his, that was what he worked for. And is there something that you think was unique about this man? I think it was the, his determination to try to do what was right for everybody. So, mm -hmm. I mean, for example, in, in 1924, 25, when um, the Indian community was suffering uh, terrible attacks um, from, from the, the, new, um, the, the new government of the Milan and Herzog, and they, they were basically going to be thrown out of the country. He leads, leads a delegation to, to India um, and they go and see the Viceroy. I mean, quite an extraordinary event. Um, and he, he links up with the, the Indian Congress in India and he addresses their conference and he makes an amazing speech saying that, you know, if only you had arms, you, you know, this small group of whites who'd been vomited up from the streets of uh, the slums of, of Europe and landed on our shores would never dare to do what they're doing now. And he was cheered for what he, what he said. But he was also capable of speaking to the Viceroy, who, after all, was the British representative in India and ruled something like 320 million people. And the, the Viceroy was really impressed with how calmly and he put forward his views. See, it was that sense that he would work with anybody to try to bring forward the position of his community as he saw it. And his community, as far as he was concerned, was anybody who was oppressed. And this would be, there were poor white people he helped, there were African people, there were Indians, there were colored people. He worked for anybody that, that, that he could. The great tragedy, of course, is that from about, from about the First World War onwards, the mood in South Africa, the political wind, was completely against him. It went gradually but firmly towards the right and became increasingly racist. And that was something that whatever he did and however much he mobilized, and however much he and the, uh, the other organizations tried to resist, they were not capable of stopping it. His funeral now had a, a big procession uh, in the city of, of Cape Town. Why then do you think that he, his story is forgotten when he was one such a popular figure? I think that's a very good question. I think that there are a number of answers to it. Mm -hmm. um, the first is that unfortunately, his personal uh, records have almost entirely been lost. Um, my guess is, and this is a pure guess on my part, um, was that his family needed the room for somebody else. His study was there and clearly had a very big study with a lot of files. I think they threw them away. A few have survived, but very, very few, which is terribly sad. The second reason is that I'm afraid that there is a narrative today in South Africa which says there was white racism and there was the ANC. And that's the end of the story. And there is an attempt now to sort of brush out anybody who didn't fit into that narrative, whether they're the Pan-Africanist Congress or the uh, or Zapo. When do you hear to them talked about? And I'm afraid that I think somebody like Dr. Abdurrahman, who was not part of the ANC, or he worked with them, but he was not a part of the ANC, doesn't fit into the government's narrative. And so they get no attention. I think it's a great pity because South African history is complex, it's detailed, it's, uh, it needs to be told in its totality. Lots of people play different roles um, and it's important that we understand really what everybody did and don't see people uh, in this kind of two-dimensional, good, bad, on, off. It's like a light switch, it, 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 that's not history. Now, what do you think that the leaders of today will learn from this politician? I think that the thing that they would learn above all else mm. is um, his belief, and I think it's the right one, in the power of debate and of rational discussion. And that, yes, you should use demonstrations and strikes if you have to, and unionization and organization, all of those are part of the democratic process. But at the end of the day, the real power of, uh, of politics should be in discussion and debate and rational thought, and not in confrontation. 
Uh, yes, I understand the need to, uh, you know, to have tough debates. Uh, I've, I've participated in some myself. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, that the, the kind of polarization which is happening in, in, in South Africa recently uh, and the, the viciousness of the debate and how crude it is sometimes, I think is something that Dr. Abiramud would not have liked. And I'm with him on that. I think that, you know, in the end, we should engage in rational discussion and careful thought because it's, it's easy to destroy and it's hard to build up. That was Martin Plot in conversation with policy about his book titled Dr. Abdullah Abdurrahman, South Africa's best elected black politician.